Whoa. Whoa, whoa. Time to pay attention, man. The San Andreas Fault is, is uh, firing up. It's shaking up, man. We're going to have to uh, pay attention to this uh, for the extra little bonus lecture on the San Andreas Fault. Yeah. Uh, by the way, bonus lectures are for your personal development. They won't, uh, they will help with your general over, your overview, but there will no, not be any test questions specifically associated with the bonus lecture. So, at your discretion. Mega quakes are among the most powerful forces of nature. They rival the destructive energy packed in an arsenal of atomic bombs. And they strike suddenly, violently, and without warning. In 2004, a mega quake in Sumatra triggered a monster wave that killed more than a quarter of a million people. In 2010, another strike, this time in Chile. This mega quake had the power of thousands of nuclear bombs. It sped up the Earth's rotation, shortened the day by a microsecond, and moved an entire town over three meters. Now, many investigators suspect that the Pacific Northwest is in the same crosshairs. Three large cities, Vancouver, British Columbia, Seattle, Washington, and Portland, Oregon, as well as 10 million people, sit right in the danger zone. As far as fatalities, it would be on par with what we saw in World War II. We would expect to have two, three, four people per thousand die. It's the same type of earthquake that we saw recently in Chile, which was a magnitude 8.8, .8, and it's the same type of earthquake that we saw in Sumatra in 2004. That was a magnitude 9, 9.1. Investigators believe the threat of a similar mega quake is real. Just offshore, hidden beneath ocean waves, lies a ticking time bomb. This is the spot where the earthquake's gonna come from. It's about uh, 12 to 15 kilometers uh, beneath the seafloor right below us here. Marine geologist Chris Goldfinger gets as close as humanly possible to the place where the Earth will start to rip apart. A mega quake strike zone. We like to think the Earth beneath our feet is solid. But take a closer look. The crust is actually made of about a dozen plates. They move, grow and grind into one another along fault lines. This is where mega quakes are born. In the region known as Cascadia, a Pacific plate named Juan de Fuca meets North America and dives below it. It's a special fault called a subduction zone. A mega quake is fueled when two plates get stuck, pressure builds, and then breaks free with fury. Investigators can't look into the earth and watch the plates, but their high-tech tools paint a picture of an impending disaster. A submarine camera captures the point where the two plates make contact, about a hundred kilometers off the coast. The video reveals little sign of trouble. But Goldfinger sees enormous and dangerous forces at work. 
Okay, we're gonna put the pole out. Sonar can detect what's invisible to a camera's lens. Yeah, okay. About where the 20 fathom mark is. Yeah, that'd be perfect. If the fault is harmless, the seabed should appear smooth and undisturbed. This would indicate the plates are slipping past each other unimpeded. If sonar detects mountains, it's a sign the plates are jammed and an earthquake is building. The sonar map is striking. The Juan de Fuca plate is jamming itself under North America, pushing up the continental shelf. The two plates are not sliding past each other. They are locked in a collision. North America is buckling under pressure from the oceanic plate. And at some point, it will suddenly release in one massive jolt. A subduction earthquake uh, is the largest type of earthquake on Earth. And the, and the reason is that um, the size of the earthquake is proportional to the surface area that actually moves during the earthquake. That surface area is huge. It is some 1,000 kilometers long from southern Canada to northern California. And at least 50 kilometers wide, making it as big as Ireland. The surface area is just giant. Very large surface area makes a very large earthquake. The fault is so large, scientists give it a special name, a mega thrust. And while they've struck before, none has ever threatened an area as highly developed as Cascadia. In recent times, there has not been a mega thrust earthquake under a major city. So we really haven't seen uh, the worst that the Earth can throw at a major city yet. Due to the fault size, the tremendous shaking could last for five minutes, a virtual lifetime of terror for those who experience it. One thing that's dramatically different about these big subduction zone earthquakes is that they take a lot longer to rupture because they rupture a large area. The threat is looming, which poses the question, exactly when will the mega thrust strike? Geologists Rob Witter and Tim Walsh are looking for clues. Some of the evidence is cryptic and obscure, like centuries-old Native American legends. They tell of a pitched battle between two creatures, the Thunderbird and the Whale. The Thunderbird is um, taken to represent strong ground shaking and the whale is taken to represent the sea. And these native stories typically depict a battle in which the Thunderbird picks the whale up and drops it on land. To geologists, violent shaking means an earthquake. But the tales also suggest that the shaking caused the sea to invade the land. This long-dead stand of trees is known as a ghost forest. And this ghost forest has a story to tell. This is a fossil forest. And like the forest behind us here, it was a healthy, vibrant forest full of uh, Western red cedar and Sitka spruce. 
Investigators suspect a mammoth earthquake sank the land. The tide invaded and created a swamp, killing the trees. Once this forest was submerged, it couldn't live with the salt water, and slowly the trees began to die off. From out of nowhere, massive waves slammed ashore. The date was the 27th of January, 1700, about when the trees in Cascadia died. That pointed a finger directly at Cascadia as being the source of that tsunami. The puzzle came together. In January, 1700, a massive earthquake hit and sank the coast, flooding the forests. It also generated a tsunami powerful enough to swamp unsuspecting villagers thousands of kilometers away. Mega quakes have devastated Cascadia in the recent past. When will the next one strike? In a frozen vault at Oregon State University, Chris Goldfinger is hunting for clues in piles of dirt. They're soil samples he's gathered from deep below the sea floor. Goldfinger suspects they could reveal how often megaquakes strike. He has about 200 cores and together they tell a story spanning 10,000 years, at least to a geologist who can read the evidence. What you see inside are sediments from the last few thousand years. This is one earthquake that goes from, from here to here. From subtle shifts in the soil, Goldfinger sees a pattern. The changes mark where an earthquake has triggered an undersea landslide. Carbon dating determines when the quakes struck. The results are ominous. In the past 10,000 years, megastrikes have hit here on 19 separate occasions. Clearly, the ground beneath Cascadia is not as stable as scientists once believed. The minimum time that we see between earthquakes is about 170 to 200 years and it's been about 310 since the last one um, we're well within the window to have another earthquake our tools can't tell us exactly when the next mega quake will strike but geologist Tim Melbourne sees clues that reveal how destructive a strike will be all right let's see the antenna here Melbourne uses state-of-the-art global positioning. All right, this looks good. All right, five lights on, that's what we like to see. GPS reveals what we can't see or feel, and the readings are disturbing. The ground here is moving. This station is moving three quarters of an inch a year, and that's because as the Juan de Fuca plate comes in under North America, the overlying North America plate is being dragged with it. GPS shines a light on the incredible force. The movement varies, but on average, the region is being shoved eastwards by four centimeters every year. 
It's a mammoth distance in geological terms. Since Cascadia's last megaquake in 1700, the region has moved by as much as 12 meters. And the GPS shows something else. The coastline is moving faster than the land further inland, causing the North American plate to buckle. A 1,000 kilometer strip is being squeezed. The crust is getting compressed, literally just like a spring. And when the fault that's driving all of this compression then breaks, that it will be the earthquake, then the spring unloads and everything launches back. The locked zone between the plates releases, and suddenly and without warning, a chunk of land the size of Ireland lurches more than 10 meters. Both the land underfoot and the waters out to sea roil and pitch with fury. If you're in downtown Seattle and the earthquake happens, you will find that you have moved towards the southwest uh, between, say, three and five meters. And if you're out on the coast, uh, you'll find you've also moved to the southwest, um, but probably more like five to ten meters. Land along the coast, pushed up by the fault over three centuries, collapses. As the plates break free, it may also unleash one of the most devastating events, a tsunami. It causes the water above that seafloor to be lifted up and then it collapses under its own weight and flows toward land and across the Pacific Ocean. The tsunami could be as high as 15 meters, tall enough to wipe entire towns off the map. The Cascadia fault line is beginning to reveal the titanic forces at play. But one question remains. How close to the metropolitan regions does the fault actually slip and generate the seismic waves? A chief worry has been that the megaquake will erupt within 150 kilometers of Seattle, the region's largest city. Now, new evidence shows it may hit much closer than that. Not far from Seattle, the fault is rumbling. The shifts aren't instantaneous, as in an earthquake. They are extremely slow. This fault that we all worry a lot about is not a dead, inanimate thing. It's actually very much alive. About 80 kilometers inland from the coast, the North American and Juan de Fuca plates grind against each other. Tim Melbourne follows these tremors on an underground instrument that continuously records the fault's movements. Okay, Rex, so this is going to go down into the sand, keep it upright, and stick that into the data logger. We can actually see it uh, in a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Where is the Cascadia fault slipping? How much did it slip by in the last 12 hours? The fault is not moving every day, but for specific short intervals, every 14 months. The shifts are the first seismic events that experts have learned to predict here. And they've come like clockwork every 14 months. At Melbourne's lab in Central Washington University, data pours in from instruments all over the state. This is only 170. Yeah, so this one's a good 60% bigger. The lock zone of the fault Rather than stopping at the coast of Cascadia, it actually comes inland, at least in the Washington state region, by as much as uh, about 50 miles. The locked zones appear to extend much farther inland than previously thought. It makes for a much more powerful quake, much closer to where people live. Seattle must now brace for a catastrophe its builders never anticipated. 
But it's not the only city facing this unwelcome news. In the middle of the continent, in America's heartland, another major quake may be building. Memphis, Tennessee is far from traditional earthquake country. Yet the ground here can move so violently it can stop the mighty Mississippi River. That's what early settlers were shocked to witness in the autumn of 1811. There were three to four very large earthquakes. And in addition to that, there were thousands of aftershocks. Witness accounts describe tremendous shaking that downs trees and chimneys, spanning 100,000 square kilometers, an area the size of Iceland. But at the epicenter, the scenes are apocalyptic. They talk about large fissures opening up and water and sand fountaining out of the ground up to 30 feet in the air. These geysers, these sand blows as they're called, covered the fields at the end of the event with lots and lots of sand and water in some places as much as three feet, maybe more. Before it's over, one large quake strikes beneath the Mississippi, uplifting the earth by tens of meters. Incredibly, the mighty river reverses course. The uplifted land would have blocked the flow of the river and forced it temporarily to flow backwards. The Mississippi has long since returned to its natural path, but the remnants of the sand geysers remain. Excavations of those geysers and hunts for hidden fault lines are exposing what happened here and what may await Memphis. Yeah. See how it resists? Yeah. Tuttle and Eugene Buddy Schweig see a disturbing record buried in fields. Yeah. That's the quakes of 1811 and 1812 were not flukes. Nice. They were just the latest in a series that stretches over hundreds, if not thousands, of years. This is the sand dike where the water and sand shot to the surface. The earthquakes turned the wet, sandy soil into a liquid. The water pressure between the sand grains starts increasing from the shaking until finally the sand grains are pushed apart so they're not touching each other anymore and the material, instead of being just a layer of sand, starts behaving like a liquid. The quakes liquefy soil around six meters underground. The increased pressure inside the liquefied soil forces it to seek an outlet. It erupts. But not all of the sand blows date to 1811 and 12. Many erupted earlier, revealing a pattern of shocks here in the heartland. The older ones seem to cluster in age around 1450 A.D. and 900 A.D., and indeed there are even some older than that. About every 500 years, there seems to have been a major earthquake, indeed a sequence of earthquakes. In a region of little other earthquake activity, thousands of kilometers from any continental plate boundary, this 500-year recurrence has rocked the field of earthquake science. you fly over the central part of the United States, all you see is a very quiet farmland. And so you don't see mountains, you don't see a fault scarp, you don't see anything. What hidden forces generate these earthquakes? Beatrice Magnani of the University of Memphis is trying to expose them. 
With no faults visible on the surface, Magnani teaches her graduate students to look for fractures underground. So we discovered a new fault. Nobody knew this fault existed and it's located right here. Now the key is understanding when this fault moved last, right? Not far from Memphis, the team hunts for fault lines by essentially taking an X-ray. We're ready to shoot. They use seismic waves, the same waves generated by an earthquake. The waves bounce off sediment below and return, where listening devices called geophones pick them up. The recordings reveal not just a single fault, but many. We're finding that there are many faults that are concealed under the sediments of the Mississippi River. Memphis's builders never realized it, but they erected their city very close to a major fault system. Memphis, Tennessee is not braced for an earthquake. But if scientists are right, it may soon face a quake that could lay waste to the city and threaten the people who live there. By some measures, actually, the hazard here is as high as in California. We say that a uh, probability of around a magnitude 6 occurring in the next 50 years is probably something on the order of uh, 80 or 90 percent. The quakes that struck here in 1811 and 1812 were even more powerful and blew sand from beneath over a vast area. These features are so large that you can see them from the air. Let's take a look at that spot over there. Okay. The sand blows stretch over thousands of square kilometers. Only large earthquakes can liquefy soil over such a wide area. I think they were very powerful earthquakes. At least one of them was on the order of a magnitude 7.6 or larger. I see this is what we see uh, down in uh, around Chalice along Highway 93 by uh, Leatherman Peak and Mount Bora down there. There's an uh, uh, that occurred in, I think it was 1989. In 1811, few buildings existed that could collapse and kill people. But recently, the world witnessed what can happen when a powerful earthquake strikes an unprepared city. This is Haiti in 2010. A magnitude 7 quake struck the capital, Port-au-Prince. Less powerful than the 1811 and 1812 quakes in the US. But it left Port-au-Prince in complete ruin. More than 200,000 people died. Memphis is not likely to suffer destruction on that scale, but the city's vulnerability worries emergency managers like Jim Wilkinson. We have a seismic event here on the magnitude that we're told that we could have, it will truly be catastrophic. Uh, it, will be, it will be something that will take every resource that we have to, to address. The ground here keeps shaking with tiny tremors. Memphis gets a reminder of the danger about four times a week. We record roughly 200 uh, earthquakes a year, and they are a magnitude between 4 and 1.5. These tremors are at the center of a controversy. They could be just aftershocks of 1811 and 1812. Skeptics also point to inconclusive GPS data. 
If there's little sign underground of forces colliding, then in their view, the fault zone here is shutting down. Their theory is that probably the 1811, 1812 and the large earthquake that happened before every 500 years have unloaded the fault system. We should expect the next earthquake to occur maybe in 10,000 years. Beatrice Magnani is among those who believe the danger is real. We should continue monitoring the seismic zone because that is the system of fault that has been rapturing for the past 5,000 years. And all you need is one. <laughs> Just outside Memphis, a hidden. F yeah, let's see what happens now. Uh, what can we do about all this? There is a revolution coming. A revolution of God. Uh, yeah. How can we prepare for something like this? Well, there are things you can do. Let's take a look. <laughs> 